Welcome back to World War One X, and uh, I'm here with uh, Professor Sarah Besky, um, Assistant Professor at the Brown University. Mm -hmm. um, now, we always start with asking about how anthropologists, or people who consider themselves anthropologists now, came into the discipline. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us what you studied, maybe at undergraduate and then through to graduate level, and your pathway to anthropology. Sure. Um, I mean, maybe I have a more conventional kind of, you know, a, 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 a approach to anthro, you know, a direction into anthropology. I remember being a sophomore in college and sitting in anthropology class and like not really knowing anything about anything. But like um, this, this class was about was about asking questions that I was already asking about the world. Like, why, you know, why do we do this? How, where is where is power in the world? How what is what is what do things mean and, and who who gets to give them meaning? And um, and kind of just asking asking really big questions about meaning and power and history and, and asking how they kind of come together in particular places and, and paying attention to the relationship between particularity um, in a in a given in a given location. Like why, you know, so the, the professor I remember taking this class with was studying violence in Northern Ireland and kind of just talking about these like really everyday interactions, you know, in pubs and, and kind of understanding, uh, you know, religious, you know, religious and conflict-based relationships through, through these just like minute everyday interactions and, and, and kind of giving that weight and it just like popped for me. I was like, holy shit, there's a whole, there's a whole discipline. I was like, oh my goodness, there's a whole discipline dedicated to just thinking about how people live their lives. And and then um, I didn't you know I didn't actually mean to go to grad school I I went uh, I went to Nepal after I graduated from college um, to work in the first public library in Nepal oh, and I was wow. like I don't know if you know this is for me and then um, I came back and ended up going to grad school but started you know to, went to, to work in Nepal um, you know years and years ago now and then and then how did you mm -hmm. find your first your, your PhD project right what was the genesis of right uh, um, so um, I, I I went to I went to grad school to work in Nepal, and, and some of the regions that I wanted to work in were um, the, there was a civil war going on, and I couldn't go back to the rural areas, um, you know, that would that wouldn't, you know, um, somehow it, it adversely affect but either the, the rural populations that I wanted to work with. So I was like, okay, so I speak Nepali, and where else can I go? And then, so for me, I drank tea, I drank a lot of tea, um, and I wanted to know more about it. Like, where does this come from? How does it kind of circulate around the world? Who who is behind? This thing, right? And um, especially, you know, in, in as an undergrad, and what brought me into anthropology is thinking about materials, thinking about the social life of things, right? Which was kind of percolating at the time, you know, when I was an undergrad. Um, so I was like, okay, so what's the social life of tea? And then what's the social life of socially just or sustainable or ecologically um, conscious? Tea. Um, and so that brought me to Darjeeling to kind of ask those questions of um, Darjeeling is um, a Nepali speaking area just over the border um, in India, in, um, well, in India from Nepal. And it's an, um, the, the laborers had been recruited there by the British um, from Nepal. So therefore, like the, the lingua franca is Nepali. So I could continue to speak Nepali. I could continue to study things and, and ask questions about the, yeah, the global circulation of ideas um, about people, place, and product. What a famous place to, to be able to go <laughs> and talk about tea. I mean, mm -hmm. Darjeeling is, is you know, almost uh, synonymous uh, with, with tea. Um, in, in the work, uh, you know, the, the borders between Nepal and India, especially in that region, are quite <laughs> yeah. jagged and all mm -hmm. over the place. I mean, what, what role does colonial history play um, in anthropology more broadly, but certainly in, in, in your work particularly? That's a great question. So, I mean, yes, the, I mean, so the region of India I work in is literally a little finger that sticks up between Nepal and Bhutan. It's like this little piece of land that was annexed originally um, in 1835 to create a hill station. And the hill station is a place of leisure, a place of respite for colonial administrators who are based um, in Calcutta. Right? Calcutta was a kind of the center of the clo of colonial operations in India. and um, people were getting sick because it was a malarial zone. So, like, where do we where do we make a sanatorium, right? That was this kind of question that British colonists were were kind of asking. It's like, well, up in the hills. And so, but what's fascinating to me as as an anthropologist who's concerned with history is how Darjeeling was was transformed to be um, something that was in the image of Brit British ideas of the countryside and British ideas of nature. So how conifers were imported and how kind of plazas were constructed and how th this, this is a city that's built on top of a 
mountainside. Like to just like kind of imagine that, um, and how like these pl places were kind of flattened out and um, and 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 back and, you know, kind of the backfill just kind of started sliding down the mountain. Um, these are and and today, right? These are places that have been deemed or that were historically deemed unfit for construction. Now people are building there because the city is growing or this town, real large town, is growing. And these are places that are in incredibly landslide um, prone now. So the there's an inter there's this constant intersection. That's just in in terms of, of between colonial history and, and the contemporary. And that's just in terms of the town. But tea, I mean, the reason why Darjeeling tea is luxurious, it's, 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 it's um, you know, exotic, it's, it's, it's valued on the market, is because of this intersection between Darjeeling as a place, as a place of, again, as a place of colonial leisure and as a place of, so a place apart in colonial India. And, and tea, the, the, the tea that's produced there still kind of has that place apartness in, in a global market, right? It is, it, is, it is more expensive, it is thought of to be refined, it is not drunk with milk or sugar, lest it, it mask the subtle flavors that, that come from being grown on the mountain. Um, so, and so, so to, to me, like to um, what what makes anthropology um, an important and, and, and a particular um, kind of um, intellectual exercise is kind of paying attention to that the the the, the legacies, right? The, the traces left by left 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 by various historical situations, right? And for me, right, the colonial colonial um, extraction, colonial landscape transformation, these are things that that I have to and, and should deal with because they they affect what today is. And, and tea itself, was it grown there before, or did the British bring it with them? The British brought it with them. And what's really fascinating about, in, I mean, Indian tea, right, and we kind of think extra, extend this out to kind of the post-colonial situation in East Africa and Sri Lanka, um, there was not really an indigenous tea consuming um, project, right, a practice. Um, there, there, there's an indigenous variety of tea that was grown kind of in the mountains, um, in, in Assam, and kind of the no very far northeast, but it was drunk for ritual purposes. And we, we can kind of see that it, from the historical record that it was drunk for ritual purposes, not grown in any sort of economy of scale, and it was not grown for any kind of everyday use. So um, for in, in terms of the northeast and Darjeeling and, 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 and areas in the northwest and, and Kangra, the British brought, like, clandestinely brought, like smuggled tea seeds from China over to India. And this is at a particular time, like, you know, beginning in the 1830s, but to, like till the late 1860s, in which, you know, the, Britain is kind of, you know, waging these wars with China to, you know, to, to, to be able to kind of, kind of continue free, free trade, right? To be able to continue trading opium in China. Um, so, the, um, so that's kind of the historical milieu in which, like, it, it's getting harder to get tea out of China. So how can we use these newly annexed, newly taken lands in, in India for the cultivation of this product that is, the, the demand is growing like exponentially in, in, um, in England, in, in Britain generally, um, in industrial centers, but in kind of elite domestic um, places as well. And, and it really hasn't stopped. It's, no, it's continuing. No. It's so can growing. you just take us a little bit from yeah. that colonial encounter of tea and yeah. Darjeeling to, to the present? And what's fascinating about tea in India to me is historically, like really until independence, like 1947, but even you know, until decades after, tea is an exported commodity. It is, I mean, it's drunk in India, but by colonial elites and by certain kind of um, elites in, in um, uh, urban centers in India, right? Calcutta, Delhi, really, I mean, really Calcutta. Um, we don't see a domestic Indian consumption, you know, practice until 1950s, really, 1960s, and even later in a lot of other parts of India. So, um, so the demand, right, the, the, for, for Indian tea is, is, is growing, right? But it's growing for, um, in terms of export, right? Tea is now this you know, healthy beverage is better than coffee, right? Being here in the United States, right? Tea, like the, the demand for tea is growing, but um, it's, it's for a particular kind of cheap tea bag tea. It's not that kind of, it's um, that you can kind of easily and readily consume. And similarly in India, um, there's a, in, in really in the 1960s, a lot of plantations replaced their, um, their machinery to, from what's called an orthodox production practice, in which is probably the tea you and I know, these little twists of tea that are oftentimes broken up for our tea bags, um, to what's called a, a CTC production machine. So CUT, CTC is an acronym for CUT, Tear, Curl. And they're like, literally like, it, it kind of like takes the tea leaves and kind of chops them up and then rolls them into these little balls that pack this super multi tannic black tea punch that is drunk with milk and sugar and kind of constitutes that, that the chai that we know from like roadside stalls or kind of domestic life in India. And so in, really in the 1960s we see um, a growth of a domestic, um, domestic in India um, tea consuming um, production and, and, and practice. 
We've talked mostly about the sort of consumerist side mm -hmm. of tea. I'd love you to talk more about you know, the people you've lived with on the plantation, the plantation workers. And in, in your book, um, you, you write about justice and sort of different forms of justice, um, property, fairness, and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. If you could just take us through some of that sure. work, it would be fantastic. So yeah, for, for years I've worked on these, um, on these plantations. Now, now I realize like 10 years I've been working on um, some of these, um, these plantations, and, and plantations, to me, um, I mean, they're, 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 you have to kind of think of them as a particular kind of historical project, right? These are these are socio-ecological systems that were that grew out of colonial rule, and they 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 still they they function, they they are, they exist very unchanged from the way they, they operated when they were kind of carved out in the in the 1860s, excuse me. And so so the, these again these are these are systems grown out of colonial occupation, colonial control, but yet they kind of exist in our um, consumer consciousness as, as a place that could deliver fair trade or organic tea right um, in in kind of the global and I guess in, in terms of global consumerism the um, the things that often come from plantations are the things that we often don't need tea sugar coffee bananas you know flowers right these 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 things that began as luxuries but were domesticated as necessary everyday items mm -hmm. um, and so to me so the how do you kind of make that plantation project palatable and how and, and so there's um, in the in in my book I look at I mean as you pointed out um, uh, property um, ideas of, about kind of intellectual property in particular um, fairness and, and and ideas about sovereignty or, or uh, political political justice um, and so right now on plantations there's um, the prop, uh, ideas of intellectual property over, overlay um, geographical indication right so many kind of place distinguished products like Bordeaux and Roquefort cheese um, share with Darjeeling these these um, intellectual property regimes that that work to try to make um, this thing only produced in the, the region in which it's supposed to be produced, right? And so in Darjeeling, there's 87 plantations, and it has to be produced on plantations that can produce Darjeeling tea. If it's produced in Nepal and but tastes just like Darjeeling tea, it's not Darjeeling tea. Um, so and 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 then the other kind of um, movement I looked at is, is fair trade, and um, and which you know tries to make which says that you know, we, we buy on our, the, the, the sides of our, our tea boxes that like, this is supposed to deliver better wages to the workers that, you know, that produced our, that thing, whether it's coffee or tea or whatever. Um, and, but both of these movements, um, ge geographical indication and fair trade, work to deliver justice for workers on behalf of workers from a particular kind of um, structure of power. Generally, you know, in the case of fair trade, right, consumers in Euro-American centers of power or in, in terms of intellectual property, right, this is a kind of bureaucratic machination. Uh, mechanization from uh, from it, within India, but also um, the World Trade Organization. Um, and so, so then, what do these strategies mean? What do these practices mean if they're meant to deliver justice on behalf of workers? And how do they kind of come into tension with workers' ideas of what justice means? And for for me, what I I looked at is um, at, the, at the time I was doing my fieldwork, a, a separate state movement kind of percolated and, and, um, and was rejuvenated in in Darjeeling to to do to do the work of justice to to break Darjeeling off from um, from the state in which it w w is existing because I mean for since independence um, they haven't gotten the boons of of, their, um, of, of development of, of independence there um, there's there's no infrastructure there's no water system like the same septic tanks have been there since in the, the 1920s right there's there hasn't been um, th this they, they feel like the state has left them behind and so they the um, plantation workers in particular are demanding a separate state in which um, say for the the land would would belong to Gorkas and tea plantation owners. Tea plantations wouldn't be broken up, but tea plantation owners would have to pay taxes to Gorkas, right? So, just kind of looking at these kind of in, like so, justice is something. And as what makes this to me anthropological is, as anthropologists, we study kind of universals in the world or, or things that are we 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 think mean something, um, but and we kind of take them apart and how and understand how they they work in a place and and how ideas about universality and particularism kind of come into tension. And so that's, that's what I'm trying to, try to do with, with the idea of justice. I was going to ask you about the role of anthropology, but you've already okay. told us all about it. Um, I remember you've also written something in Savage Minds about place mm -hmm. and sort of movement, and, and we focus on arriving mm -hmm. rather than the journey or even the beginning of that journey. And I'm wondering, um, I mean, we started out and you, you were talking about you personally, you know, drinking tea and, mm -hmm. and already being implicated in these mm -hmm. global, <laughs> global yeah. uh, assemblage of, 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 of being a consumer. Um, how how personal is is it you know as an anthropologist 
how personally invested do you become and, and what, you know, in, what, in what ways is it personal and in what ways is there no difference between being a professional anthropologist and, and just a human being? Okay. Also in, 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 in place, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean for what I, what I try to remind my students is just to kind of think about, think about relationality, right? Mm -hmm. And, where, and where, where are relations and how do you study not just causal relations but the relationship between relationships and how can you situate yourself within, within a kind of global, a global system, right? We are, not, we are not segregated individuals anymore. Um, but, I mean, to me it's hard. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I mean, to, to, to use, I mean, for, for me to kind of use my, um, my, my visceral reactions to place, my visceral kind of understandings of place, um, I mean, I guess the, 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 the way I kind of do that, the way I'm attuned to that is as, a, as an anthropologist, right? And going back to that, your, your first question about, you know, why did I come to anthropology? Because um, maybe because I'm always like, I mean, there's, a, there's a little bit of, you know, not, the word's not discomfort, but like being able to kind of like, think um, about how things relate to each other. And that was something that I've, I think I've just been a little, you know, been doing for a really long time. And what I really, um, what I like kind of glob onto about anthropology is like, how do we understand relationships? And so how can something as banal as moving through place actually understand how, how a landscape is and how a landscape is constructed? Um, and how, what does it feel like? What does it sense, what does it, what does it smell like? And how do, you, how do you literally move through that? And so there's a particular kind of like shared sense of, of, of personhood that comes with that, but I'm always kind of attuned to, the, to, to, to my position and my positionality vis-a-vis -vis the people I work with. I don't move through space the same mm -hmm. way, but I can try to understand how people move through space. Maybe uh, on, on just on that, can you share the story, um, again, that Savage Minds article about you walking? Because I think, <laughs> I think most anthropologists walk, you know, yeah. in, in the field site. And, and the sort of experiences we have walking mm -hmm. with the macaque monkeys in... Yeah. in on the plantation. Yeah, so for me, I mean, ethnographies are certainly certainly about people, but they're about place as well. And so, like, how do I write place? I often just remind or like close my eyes and remember walking. And so, some of the most like evocative memories of me walking are um, I, I mentioned this kind of flat pl flat plaza that the the British like literally carved out to, um, to you know as a walking path for for for, for leisurely walks. Um, and but um, around, so it's, it's kind of this circle, and on the top of, um, on, the, t on the, the kind of the, the ridge above, um, around, on the t in the middle, in the top of this circle, is a temple where kind of these macaques, macaques live, and they, in the morning they descend um, to, to get snacks that, that um, kind of circumambulating um, walkers will kind of leave for, as, as, as offerings to the temple and as to the, t to the temple monkeys. But this coincided with when I was going to the plantations. So, <laughs> so you know, when hiking kind of down the mountains to the plantations. And so kind of, as I would kind of, you know, walk through and there would always be like this pack, like this horde of, of macaque monkeys like nibbling on like whatever it may be, like scraps from the night before and people's dinner. And so, yeah, I mean, I. I've been mugged by a monkey like many times, right? They kind of like grab your, you know, your satchel and kind of take it and look for look for good stuff and leave the stuff they don't want. Um, but yeah, no, I would I would, I would kind of like try to um, kind of cling on to one of these Tibetan aunties that were doing their 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 um, and I and, um, their their kind of circumambulation and try to kind of move through um, because they would always mug me, but they would never mug them. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like a protective um, person, but yeah, I mean that that kind of that that kind of um, interaction, that that memory to me is just such. Um, I mean, a distillation of of of, of Darjeeling because um, right at it, it, the at the same time, so you have you know a refugee population, you have um, a you know this these kind of sacred animals that um, are probably the the you know, what, some of the more you know the Darjeeling was kind of is a settler colony in a way. Um, everyone, most people there came to build, to work, to to carve out this hill station. But to think about the monkeys as kind of these. These, pe these people that kind of, um, have, or these, these beings that have been there for, for as long as anyone else, if not longer, um, it's kind of, it's just, it's kind of evocative, right? This temple was the only even structure that the British acknowledged to even be there when they annexed the region, right? They, the reason why they were able, they were able to or justify their annexation was that it was um, swinging cultivation. And so the, 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 the land was not being utilized. It was, quote unquote, wasteland. The, the only structure that they acknowledged even being there and the only people they acknowledged being there was this Buddhist Hindu temple and the Tibetan um, monks that were, um, and, and kind of temple guardians that were, that were there. Wow, very interesting. <laughs> um, I think 
One, one other question we, we ask everyone is um, to define anthropology. Okay. To someone who, who is new to the discipline or new yeah. to anthropology, how would you define what anthropology is, is to you? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great question. I probably will define it differently sometimes. But to, today, just thinking about the world, um, it's, uh, to me, anthropology is a study of human diversity, but with a particular attention to the intersections of history, power, and meaning. So I feel like for me as an anthropologist, like in, in translating what, what I try to do as an anthropologist, like what kinds of questions do you ask? Well, you know, I mentioned we don't, we don't, we don't look for causal relations, like what caused this? Like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the plantation caused poverty. No, no, it's like, what does the plantation mean? Like in terms, terms of like how we ask questions of the world. What does, what does something mean and how is it implicated? How is it, how is it situated within wider kind of webs of knowledge, right? What is, what is knowledge and how is it, how is it constructed? And who and whose knowledge is, is, is thought to be important or whose knowledge is recognized? So the, again, and, and how is that a historical process, right? Where is history in that, right? This didn't just happen. Um, so how can we situate what we see in the contemporary, right, in our study of kind of human life and human diversity, but um, historicize it, pay attention to power, and ask, ask questions about meaning? Just on that, ask questions. I think in, in the course, one of the most contentious issues I think everyone's always discussing and debating is what kind of anthropology anthropologists should be doing. Mm. Engaged, public, activist, militant, you know, there's, there's a range of uh, yeah. anthropologies out there in terms of how much of us is in the project, is in the field, is in post-field, you know, when we come back. That's and how we talk and write about what we've experienced. Where would you situate yourself in... Does mm -hmm. it not, not, doesn't have to be on the spectrum, but you know, yeah. maybe you have your own, <laughs> my, my your own, own term. My own thing, maybe it's just like, you know, for professional anthropologists, like to get out and go do more field work and, get, and to be and to, and to think and to kind of continue um, to, to situate the kind of big, again, what makes anthropology a particular kind of uh, intellectual project for me is to look at really big questions through particularly small lenses or, or seemingly small lenses, right? You know, a plantation in Darjeeling. How do you ask questions about colonial, um, colonial histories, colonial occupation, what um, inequality through this, this particular little place? So to get out and keep going back to the plantation and, 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 and keep, continue to ask people about those questions and to um, and then to, to try to I mean whether it's engaged or public or whatever um, to you know to put those out put to put the representations and and stories about the people we work with out in accessible intelligible you know in ways right such that such that their their stories are heard in, in whatever kind of capacity we can make them heard do, do you think stories are particularly evocative in terms of getting people to engage with what you're saying Personally, I do. I mean, that's how I kind of relate to anthropology. That's, I mean, it, it may it become, it speaks to perhaps my training and, and how I, you know, how I kind of came to anthropology, right? I'm, I'm really interested in things and the stories about those things, right? And the stories that people tell about those things. So, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of materially grounded, but yet grounded in, in kind of narrative representations um, as well. So, yeah, no, I, I, I love stories. <laughs> what, a, what a great place to end. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you.